Hello, my friend. Sit beside me, take a drink, and let me tell you the strange story of Jeff the Talking Mongoose. In the autumn of 1931, the Irving family, residents of a farmhouse at Dawlish Cashin on the Isle of Man, reported the presence of a strange mongoose-like creature that had begun to appear around and inside their home. The bizarre circumstances began when, according to the Irvings, the sound of scratching, rustling and vocal noises were heard within the walls of the tiny farmhouse. Believing it to be a rodent infestation, they placed traps. However, no rodents were found, and the strange noises persisted, growing ever more disturbing. Trying to scare away whatever was causing the sounds, James, the Irving family patriarch, growled like a predator. Far from frightened, the creature growled back. The Irving's farmhouse was soon plagued by more growls, barks, hissing and the crying of what sounded like a baby. As time progressed it became apparent that whatever was responsible for the strange noises was a skilled mimic, able not only to imitate what it heard but capable of learning and retaining. Soon the mysterious entity was picking up human language by listening to the Irvings, making gurgling noises like a baby attempting to speak for the first time. The Irvings' 12-year-old daughter, Vori, took to reciting nursery rhymes and asking the being to repeat them. According to the Irving family, the entity did so in a clear, high-pitched voice. Soon after, it introduced itself to the family as Jeff, an extra clever mongoose. Jeff told the Irvings that he had been born in Delhi, India in 1852. He liked to gossip would travel around the island picking up all sorts of information, usually quite trite and banal. He would, however, always return to the Irving family farmhouse at Dawlish Cashin, where he would regale James, his wife Margaret, and young Vori with village gossip, and would, the family claimed, even read aloud from the local newspapers before nesting in his sanctum, an alcove situated above Vori's bedroom. The relationship between Jeff and the Irving family was, certainly at first, an uneasy one. Jeff was often guilty of what he light-heartedly called devilment. His loud, boisterous banging on the walls and his satanic laughter engendered fear and hostility in the Irvings. They believed that Jeff, the entity, was trying to scare them out of the farmhouse. One day, as James sat by a window, he spied a very large cat striped like a tiger. He reported, We ourselves did not possess a cat, and I called Vori to come to the window to look at it. She did so and remarked on the size of the cat, but more especially the unusually large bulldog head it had. James quickly realised that the cat was neither a regular English cat, nor a Manx tailless cat, went outside with his single barreled shotgun intending to chase it away. However, mysteriously, he lost the trail. He said, The cat was a little ahead of me, but easily within range, and it turned through an open gateway into a grass field. I was there a few seconds behind and fully expected to see the cat, but no cat could be seen, look as I liked. The field was level and there was not a bush or any roughness where he could have hidden and the hedges were all earth, or salt hedges, as they are called here. I detailed my experience to my wife on her return that night, and Jeff called out, It was me you saw, Jim. The relationship between Jeff and the Irving's daughter, Voiri, is an interesting one, and one that bears uncanny similarity to poltergeist hauntings. From the time of the initial appearance of Jeff in 1931, Voiri often played a central role in the events that took place. It was Voiri who read and recited the nursery rhymes that taught Jeff to speak, and members of the local Manx community told of how Voiri could often be seen walking to school or into the village talking to Jeff, who accompanied her. Though Jeff could not be seen, he always conveniently obscured himself by walking behind a hedge or stone wall, people reported that they could clearly hear his replies. This led sceptics to wonder if the voice of Jeff was actually Voiri all along, and merely the result of the girl's talent for ventriloquism. Jeff's sanctum was in Voiri's bedroom, and, in the early days of the infestation, the then 12-year-old Voiri seemed to be the focus of the entity's attention. James Irving reported, 
On account of Jeff's menacing attitude, threats and stone throwing, etc., we decided for safety's sake to remove Voira's bed into our room and proceeded to do so. While dismantling the bedstead, Jeff, who was behind a wainscot, screamed, stormed and threatened what he would do to us. The voice was absolutely full of malice, hatred and spleen, and he was striking a wainscot with his fist with the greatest violence. When the removal had been completed, in a high-pitched voice, fairly trembling with rage, he screamed out, I'll follow her wherever you move her. Indeed, even after the relationship between Jeff and Voiri became less fearful and troubled, Jeff's activities were often centred upon or around the girl, leading some to argue that Jeff was a poltergeist. A poltergeist, a combination of the German terms for crash, polter, and ghost, geist, is a noisy spirit that often throws objects violently, rattles cupboards and drawers, and generally makes a loud nuisance of itself. Poltergeist activity often involves an adolescent who is suffering from emotional turmoil when the activity begins. Indeed, in one of the most infamous poltergeist cases, the Enfield poltergeist, paranormal activities were centred around 11-year-old Janet Hodgson. In the Danny poltergeist case, it was 14-year-old Jason Cobb. In the Battersea poltergeist case, the activity was centred around 15-year-old Shirley Hitchings, and in the Thornton Heath poltergeist case of the 1930s, involved the 16-year-old son of a Mr and Mrs Forbes. Some believe that adolescents are the focus of poltergeist activity because these spirits are attracted to hormonal fluctuations and or unresolved emotional stress, repressed anger, hostility and sexual tension. Others argue that there are actually no spirits or entities involved at all, and that it is the individuals themselves that generate bursts of telekinetic energy which cause objects to move through recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. Though the individual, or agent, generating this energy is unaware of their role in events. Either way, it would seem that where there is unexplained poltergeist-like activity, there is usually an adolescent involved. When asked directly if he was a poltergeist, Jeff is said to have responded in the negative, saying, I am not like one of those, claiming instead to be more like an Indian familiar. As is inevitably the case in small communities such as that on the Isle of Man, gossip about the Irvings and their mysterious spook spread quickly around the village. Jeff even garnered a mention or two in local press, under headlines such as Man Weasel, Mystery Grips Island, Queerest Beast Talks to Daily Dispatch Reporter from the Daily Dispatch in 1932. Before long, word had spread further afield, and in 1932, psychic investigator Harry Price arranged for a colleague, Harold Dennis, to travel to Cashin's Gap to investigate the case. Dennis conducted numerous interviews with the Irvings, as well as many local residents who had claimed to have heard Jeff talking, or had other kinds of eerie encounters which they attributed to Jeff. A sample of hair said to be Jeff's was sent down to the Zoological Society of London, and a plaster cast that James Irving claimed to be of Jeff's teeth and paws was sent to the Natural History Museum for analysis. While the hair was identified as dog hair, likely from the Irving's sheepdog, the origins of the plaster imprints could not easily be determined. They did not match any known animal, although it was stated that they in no way resembled the paws or teeth of a mongoose. Though tangible evidence was not forthcoming, there were certainly some strange occurrences during Dennis's visits to the Irvings farmhouse. From disembodied voices, we, Dennis and the Irvings, sat and talked until just about 11.45pm, and as nothing had taken place, I suggested making my way back to Glen May. Just as I had shut the door of the house, we heard a very shrill voice from inside scream out, Go away! Who is that man? Mr Irving gripped my arm and said, that's it. To objects moved or thrown violently. Chill screams accompanied by terrific knocking and loud bangs emanated from all parts of the house in quick succession, as if the perpetrator moved with lightning speed. The bangs appeared to come from the roof, Mr and Mrs Irving's room, over the kitchen and on the staircase. The noise continued for about 15 minutes, culminating with tremendous bangs as if something had been thrown with great violence upstairs. So we went again to Voira's room and found that a heavy chair which Mrs Irving had put on the staircase covering had been flung from its place and fallen partly on the bed and partly on a chest of drawers. Voiry, who was awake, said, Oh, it's only some more of Jeff's tricks. 
but did not appear at all perturbed. Note that Voiry Irving was once again at the centre of this violent activity. Around the closing of the 1930s, Jeff's visitations became less frequent, and Margaret and Voiry eventually left the farmhouse in 1945 following James Irving's death. The following year, the new owner, actor Leslie Graham, claimed to have shot Jeff, but pictures of the dead animal showed it to be a large black and white creature. Upon seeing the pictures, Voiry Irving was adamant that the thing Graham had shot was not Jeff. Ultimately, the investigations of Dennis and Price as well as those of several other researchers, were never able to provide real evidence in support of the Irvings' claims, nor to prove or disprove conclusively the existence of Jeff. Harry Price was sceptical and wrote in private correspondence that the affair is susceptible of a psychological explanation, elaborating that the whole family must be mixed up in it, but there still remains a question of motive. The motive for the imposture lies much deeper than mere publicity, that is what makes the case so interesting. Voiry Irving died in 2005. Throughout her life she shied away from any public notoriety, but always insisted that Jeff was real and that the case of the Dolby spook was not a hoax. One thing is certain though, regardless of whether it was real or a hoax, the tale of Jeff the extra special talking mongoose is one of UK folklore's strangest and most fascinating stories. And there you have the strange tale of Jeff, the talking mongoose. I hope you found it interesting, and if you did, why not like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Have a safe journey home, my friend, and I hope to see you again very soon.